Greetings, Tony from Old River Hard Goods again. you're listening to is titled Avalanche Ride, it's from my fourth CD, Eastern Bridge, and as always, there's a link to the full version of the song on Reverb Nation, as well as an older YouTube video, which was me actually recording the guitar part for the piece. And today's video, we're going to just look at some different types of vintage Woodworking tools, both of the collectible and usable variety. So, hopefully that'll pique your interest and you stick around and maybe even learn something. So, sit back and enjoy. Today, we're going to take a look at a draw knife. This one's got adjustable handles on it. And was made by the James Swan Corporation company. It's got an 8 inch blade on it. And this style was originally patented by Richard Watrous on December 15, 1857. Patent number 18877. They were originally made by the Noble or Nobles Manufacturing Company of Elmira, New York. A variety of different styles and shapes. Um, of course, by the time Swan was making them, the original patent had long expired. And this one's in decent condition. I mean, both of the screws here work, or nuts work. Somebody added washers to help tighten things up a bit, but that's a common problem with them. The blade does have some patina, and unfortunately, somebody kind of power washed this guy at some point. See the scuff marks? There are some pitted spots on there. Both of the handles are black walnut. They're original, but unfortunately, both of them do move a bit. Uh, there's a way of fixing that, but that gets way you know, a lot more time than I want to have invest in this guy since how much I had to pay to get it in the first place. So, but it's kind of a handy tool, kind of a usable tool. I got these locked down just for now, so I can't show you, but you can position the handles any way you want. So, if you want to have it so you're cutting like this, the handle's in this position, and the blade running this way, you can do that. Don't know how many people would do it, but it is possible to do that, or you can just change the angle of it slightly. It's a pretty handy design, and I know from the number of Noble's knives I've seen over the years, um, it must have been fairly popular, considering the extra cost for it. So, anyway, it's not a great, you know, not in great condition, but it's still a pretty good collectible old tool. Well, if you watch my video on Chairmaker's Tools, uh, I talk about a number of the different hollow augers out there, especially those made by the Stearns Company. And this one is another one of their products. Edward Stearns was granted patent number 225496 on March 16, 1880 for the design of this one. Yeah, this one's kind of in decent shape. Uh, it does have the original depth stop. 
the one screw was replaced, but it fits properly. It's got some patina. I didn't go too crazy with the cleaning on it, but it works. Blade's not too bad. There you can see the name and the patent mark. The rulings are readable. Tang's got a few dings, but this is not a very common, commonly found one of these guys by this maker. Here we have another Stanley bench plane that I recently restored. Ah, uh, this is a number four. And this is a Type 19, which is made by Stanley. Uh, that whole run went from 1949 until 1961. Although this one does look to be just a little on the earlier side, at least to my eye. There were some subtle feature changes over the run. Mainly the tote got a little more rounded on the top and that. But anyways, you know, that's my opinion. And this one's in decent condition. I mean... Sides aren't too bad. A few scratches, a few spots. Sole does have this patterning on it. It's like a rust etching of some sort. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah, so you can see it better. Yep. But somebody wanted to drop this on a belt sander. It would get, look right pretty when done. There's nothing deep there. Folks ask, why don't you do that? Well, I don't do that. That's not my thing. Um, I do have a buddy who runs a machine shop. And I can always run over there and have him tune up right pretty like. But seeing as how it's 20 miles there and back each direction. And 40 minutes because of traffic and all that each direction. And for the time and then the cost to get it done folks don't want to pay that extra hundred bucks on there to buy a perfect plane so hey but it's there the cap's not too bad a little frosting on it but it's got all the plating the blade well the blade's got some character there's a little line of rust etching on the underside but the face is clean the back is kind of gnarly Cap also has some rust section. Tote and knob are fairly good. They've got some dings to the finish, but at least most of it's there. Oops, there's a lot of paint I missed. I'll have to peck that off before I do the uh, for sale picture. So, anyways, you know, I'm going to be doing a lot of these in the coming months only because I'm up to my yin yang in them. You know, here's a Number three that's hiding over in the corner here. It's a type, uh, type 16. Uh, Pre-World War II. That I'll need to dig out and do. So, anyways. You know, this ain't the prettiest, but it will get the job done. take a closer look at these Tavisher shaves that I picked up on my recent trip to Jacktown. Tavisher is a spoke shave used by chair makers for shaping out the seat, the sitting portion of the seat, the butt portion, whatever. They are not very common tools. I mean, yeah, you just rarely, rarely find them. So anyways, First one is a smaller one. This one's probably closer to what most folks consider to be a Tavisher with the more wing-like handles on it. Uh, I can't, I'm not sure of the wood. It looks like possibly maple or something like that. It doesn't look like beech, but you know, this one's pretty good shape. A little bit of a check there from the uh, where the sole plate screw was put in. That might have been added later. The blade removes with screws, but they work, and the blade's got a little bit of pit to it, but nothing too bad. And, uh, this is a really, really nice one of these guys. 
you know, I wish I could find more of them, but what are you going to do? Next up is this one, which was made by, you know, let me flip around so I get the marks right, uh, David Flather and Sons of Sheffield, England. Uh, they were in business until uh, from the 1850s till uh, 1911. And it's got this hardware store mark, the Urban Hardware Store Company, which, according to what I find online, they were incorporated in 1925. But I don't know. Well, the marks are identical. I mean, the stamps look to be the same, so they're done by the same hand. And why there's such a big gap, hard to say. But this one's kind of in decent shape. Uh, as you can see, it's got some stain in it. The sole was repaired at some point in time, and this copper plate was added. Blade was also replaced. You can see where the square tang holes were plugged and with this screw-type blade on it, but that one's fairly good. And uh, this is kind of neat. It's definitely got some history to it. And I'm sure there's more to be discovered about it at some point but and last is this one body looks like beach a little bigger no maker's mark except on the underside of the blade there is a picture of a i shouldn't say a picture there is a leaf touch mark which i'll show in this uh, picture here And uh, this one also cleans up pretty good. A few dings, stains, what have you. A little chip in here along the tang hole. But blade stays in place. The blade is uh, pretty clean. A few dots of pitting again. But, and the sole does have some wear. I never got around a plate in this one. But boy, tell you what, that's another nice one. And this is a good, good set of these. That they're they're off to a a fine home. That's for sure. Another uh, recent restoration I did was on this record number seven or O seven as they call it, joiner plane. And these are made in England, of course. And the big problem with these guys, like the English Stanleys, is that Somebody decided it was going to be a good idea to spray the sides and the soles and the blades and everything else with this, some kind of lacquer or shellac. I never have figured out what it is. My stripper doesn't work with it, and I just never can seem to find my acetone when I'm dealing with one of these guys. But the problem with that stuff is, instead of preventing rust, it absorbed moisture, held it in close to the metal, and made these things rust even faster. Fun, fun, fun. And this one cleaned up reasonably well. I mean, a little stain, a little frosting, but it wasn't too messed up to begin with. Get a better view of the sole there. And this side here, a couple of dings. The tote and uh, knob are stained hardwood of some kind, but... They've got almost all the finish. Again, a couple dings. The blade's fairly good in it. Yeah. Okay, come on. If you just went on, you got to come off. There we go. See, the cap's got a little frosting on it. The blade's got a little stain in it and what have you. Or the chip breaker's got some stain in it and the exposed area. But the cotton base on it turned out pretty good. Uh, this up. Yeah, I'm getting real tricky one hand today. Let's see. So, you know, it's a, tell you what, this is a good quality plane. Oh, the purists will say, yeah, but my 120 year old Stanley's much better, but there ain't too many of those guys around. There ain't too many of these guys around over here. Most ones you see for sale are coming out of England, so. Anyways, a solid user and a good collectible for sure. And here we're going to take a look at a Coachmaker's Rider plane I recently picked up in Jacktown. 
Now these are used for doing um, inlay work, decorative inlay work, routing out the channels and grooves on the various sections of the carriages, the doors, the, all the other parts and pieces. And this one's made of oak, no maker's mark, 18 inches long, and the cut is 1 eighth of an inch wide. And uh, as you can see, it's got some wear, some stain, a couple bits of paint there I missed and didn't want to come off. The uh, mouth plate's got some scratches and scuffs and looks like it's been opened uh, a little at some point or maybe that's just how it was made. It's got the fence here with the adjustable fence which works. The iron, as you can see, goes uh, either direction. Uh, the wedge had a piece, another shim piece, I don't know if it was metal or wood that was stuck in there when I first knocked it out. Unfortunately, that fell down into the debris field under the workbench, and I wasn't going to spend three hours trying to find it, so I just replaced it with another piece of wood on here. Works fine, does a job, looks good, etc., etc., etc. So, but, you know, these guys aren't as common as they used to be. Not that they were very common to start with. And sad to say, I remember when there was a time when a nice old tool like this would bring 45, 50 bucks without me even breaking a sweat. And nowadays, it's going to be tough getting 30 bucks for it. But, you will have this, seeing as how people don't really appreciate a lot of these old trade tools anymore. And the last tool we're going to take a look at for today's little video is a Miller Falls number no. 3 Rogers Patent T Auger Handle. George Rogers of Greenfield, Massachusetts was granted patent number 485. 4050 on October 11, 1892 for the design of this tool, although the patent's slightly different, but this is how Miller Falls implemented it. These aren't signed, at least I've never seen one that was. They may have had a paper label or something on them at some one point, but they most of them didn't survive the <coughs> survive the journey. And this one's in reasonably good shape. It was pretty messed up around the head areas, so I did the old refinish job. Hey, you know, what, what can I say? But the screw works, jaws are good. The handles do have some dings. This one has some scratches and what have you. They're oak. But, you know, it's... These aren't not that common. I mean, that's one of those tools I do keep a watch out for. And you don't find too many of them. Of course, they were bringing some really crazy money there on eBay at one point. I remember they were selling for $75, $85. Uh, they kind of dropped down a bit, thanks to the idiots that give, give stuff away for $10, $20. But, you know, if I was in charge, we'd fix that. But I ain't in charge, so I can't fix that. But anyways, if you're looking to drill some holes big and deep, this is a tool to have. Well, no flea market segment again. The pickings have just been bleak. But hopefully we're going to be getting into the summer season in a few more weeks. And, well, i got Patina coming up, and so she shall see what happens. Anyways... I hope you enjoyed my little presentation, and as always, if you like what you're seeing, please hit that subscribe button to be notified when new videos are posted. Thanks for watching, and bye!